So thanks very much for having me here. Um, I'll give you a little bit of context of, um, of uh, my relationship with Araha. Uh, we met about um, five or six years ago in New Zealand, and um, right away we realized how um, how similar our interests were and what you know areas of interest um, we shared. And so um, since then. Um, whenever opportunities arise, we try to find time to uh, work together, and um, we've got a collaborative project that we're working on right right now, and we're fortunate to have this opportunity to be able to present um, together with you here, too. Um, so today, uh, what I want to talk about is a project that I'm working on right now um, with the Treaty Relations Commission of Manitoba. And uh, so... Uh, I'm not sure if you know the acronym NEAR, N-E-A-H-R. It's Network Environments for Aboriginal Health Research. And this is a network across Canada of eight diff or nine different centers of um, Aboriginal health research. And uh, there's one at the University of Toronto, there's one at Saskatchewan, Saskatoon, there's one in Manitoba, and it's located in Winnipeg. And those centers are um, usually co-run with a community organization. And um, in Manitoba, it's co-run with the um, Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs. So it's called the Manitoba First Nations Center for Aboriginal Health Research. And uh, they um, funnel funding, uh, federal funding from CIHR uh, through to different projects um, on Aboriginal health research. And so they had this one award called the New Investigator Award. Um, which is fantastic. It um, buys you some time to do some research, and I'm fortunate enough that our NEAR, um, the, the Center for Aboriginal Health Research, recognizes historical research as uh, important to health research as well. So they define health very broadly, and uh, they've welcomed uh, historians into their midst. So, um, so that's really fortunate. But the, the project I'm talking about right now is, um, is part of my new investigator grant. And with this, uh, the, the Treaty Relations Commission of, Ma of Manitoba, that's uh, an organization that's a partnership of Manitoba First Nations and the, the federal government to uh, basically work on public education about treaties, um, about um, kind of working through processes of uh, settlements of treaty, uh, outstanding treaty claims, uh, and, uh, and also you know, to, to conduct several research projects, one of which is an oral history project with elders from different treaty areas in Manitoba. And another is to create a historical atlas of Manitoba treaties. So that atlas, um, the aim is to kind of show a history of human land relations, as well as uh, First Nations uh, relations with other Manitobans. And so there's different topics that are, that are going to be uh, examined in that, that uh, atlas, including the fur trade, um, different kind of patterns of settlement, and um, uh, different uh, First Nations communities. And uh, I was asked to do uh, a plate, uh, an atlas plate on health. Um, and in particular, there's a real interest in having a kind of re-examination of the history of hospitalization in Manitoba, particularly uh, right now. Uh, there's an interest in the history of TB sanatoria. So, uh, so this is kind of the, the research to date. The uh, plate isn't done yet, um, so you're kind of getting a, a midway through the project kind of presentation, but I can let you know what's going on uh, with it. Um, the basically, my idea with the plate was to, first of all, show on the map where the TB sanatoria four First Nations in Manitoba were. There were three specific ones for First Nations. Um, I also wanted to show <coughs> a bit about the kind of uh, um, federal government's approach to Indian health services and their kind of philosophy of um, the treatment of tuberculosis. And so that included surveying First Nations communities um, to find cases of tuberculosis, removal of those cases to particular kinds of hospitals, and then a kind of program of treatment that included surgery for tuberculosis, um, a, a range of different antibiot uh, antibiotics, uh, but also a program of kind of social treatment as well, which included education, um, occupational therapy, and rehabilitation. So I don't know exactly how I'm going to map that part. That might actually just exist as text alongside the map. 
Um, but I also wanted to take a look at one of the TV sanatoriums and uh, take a look at the architecture of it and kind of unmap that, kind of understand mid 20th century Canadian hospitals, kind of the way that they're set up. So, uh, so that's the kind of outline of what I'll be talking about today. Um, again, as Era had mentioned earlier, we don't get often get an opportunity to talk to um, healthcare specialists. So this is a real, um, a real uh, pleasure to be able to do. Uh, but as you know, uh, you probably know more about the the, uh, the disease of tuberculosis uh, than I do. <laughs> right? Okay. Good. Good. <laughs> you haven't done it yet. Okay. Good. <laughs> All right. Well, um, tuberculosis is an infectious disease. Um, and in, uh, in Canada, there has been two kind of different, ma or two main kind of forms of it. Um, in the late 19th century, there was an epidemic of uh, tuberculosis that um, hit the neck glands, and it was called scrofula sometimes. And uh, then the 20th century kind of epidemic form um, often hit uh, people's lungs. And so it was obviously an uh, infectious disease, so it was contracted by coughing. Um, and there are different kinds of symptoms, fatigue, weight loss. Sometimes um, in the early 20th century, they called tuberculosis consumption, the consumption, um, which basically kind of referred to the, the way that it kind of consumed your body, um, you know, referred to that weight loss. Um, and for uh, certain uh, populations, particularly, those who live in conditions of poverty, the disease could be deadly. And so um, there's, a, there's a range of different symptoms, but um, death was kind of in, the death rates were higher for certain kinds of populations than others. So when we're dealing with uh, the specific history of First Nations people in tuberculosis, again, we're looking at uh, epidemic periods in the 1870s and 80s. There's a time around the turn of the century where fewer people are contracting the disease, and then again in the 60s, um, sorry, the uh, 1940s to the 1960s. And if you think about those time periods, um, the 1870s to the 1880s in the Prairie West um, was the time when those treaties were being signed. And um, many, many First Nations communities were um, suffering from starvation, poverty, um, they had been marginalized, their lands were being cut up to uh, basically create homesteads for um, settlers who were coming to Canada. And so it's a time, you know, of poverty, and um, in those time periods we think that that's, you know, that's when we're, we're facing the kind of danger of spread of disease, infectious diseases. And again, in the, the mid-20th century, uh, many First Nations communities were um, kind of suffering from uh, policy overload. They were getting a lot of intervention on the, uh, from the, the, govern the federal government. And um, again, we're, we're still uh, very poor communities. So uh, although uh, all people um, who breathe can contract uh, tuberculosis, um, First Nations people were ver much more likely to um, become very sick with it and um, to die from it. Uh, and until the 1940s in Canada, there was very a very slight response from the federal government. Uh, so when we're dealing with First Nations people, you know this already, but uh, the uh, federal government um, historically has been responsible for the delivery of health care services to First Nations. Um, and... Uh, until 1945, that was done through the Department of Indian Affairs. And uh, Indian Affairs also dealt with, you know, welfare, education, um, kind of a program of civilization or assimilation. Um, and healthcare was very low on its priorities. And uh, healthcare was kind of more expensive as well. And so there was not very much of a response until, really until the late 30s, early 40s. Uh, and at that time, uh, doctors, physicians, um, there was an, an organization called the Canadian Tuberculosis Association. They were bringing to the public this, um, uh, this idea that uh, First Nations people were actually getting sicker from tuberculosis. They were dying at higher rates and that the government needed to kind of make a, a larger intervention. Um, and uh, 
the Canadian Tuberculosis Association has different branches across the country, and in Manitoba, uh, the branch is called the Manitoba Sanatorium Board. And uh, a few of the key doctors who were involved with the Manitoba Sanatorium Board really pushed the government, suggesting that um, because uh, tuberculosis is an infectious disease, until um, all people who lived in Manitoba were well, nobody was kind of safe from getting the disease. And they pointed out the higher death rates among First Nations people, made the white communities that were in the surrounding areas around reserves susceptible to getting tuberculosis. And so they kind of depict First Nations as a disease menace, and they use this as a, as a way of kind of creating an argument or justifying more uh, federal intervention into, uh, or response into the diseases. So uh, they begin in the late 30s to, to survey reserves and, um, and residential schools uh, for basically to count how many people had the disease. There's, there's two different forms of the disease. You can have active tuberculosis and you can also just have the, the disease in an inactive case. And so people who had active cases had those symptoms. They could also pass on the, uh, the infection to others. And so um, specifically, the, those surveys are looking for active cases of tuberculosis. And I just had a couple of examples of their, uh, this is the uh, Manitoba Sanatorium Board's Christmas seals. So this was a way of kind of raise fundraising for this organization. And it's important, this organization is not a government organization. It is a private, um, you know, uh, organization that promoted health, that studied tuberculosis. And um, this is significant because uh, that organization basically gets relied on by the federal government to deliver um, these services to First Nations people. So the federal government gives money to the uh, Manitoba Sanatorium Board to run hospitals, to do these surveys, um, but yet they're not the government. So when it comes, you know, 60, 70 years down the road and some historian is interested in looking at the records, those records don't exist as government records. They exist as private, th the re records of a private organization, which means that that organization can <coughs> tell you, no, you can't look at the records. So even though they're funded federally, um, they were not, you know, First Nations people didn't have a choice of whether they would or would not partake in those surveys or go to the hospital. You know, they're, they're, still, um, they're still able to kind of keep those records closed, which has meant that so far the research has, has been pretty minimally based on, um, on the annual reports of the, the Manitoba Sanatorium Board. But hopefully those records will be open soon and uh, we'll be able to learn more about that organization. But this is the kind of uh, thing that you would find in the Manitoba Sanatorium Board annual report. What they like to do is they like to show um, the change over time in the rate of contraction of tuberculosis um, and deaths um, occurring. So if you see over here, you've got your year. They always separated rates of tuberculosis among Indians and um, the Manitoba like full population, or um, sometimes they call that a white population. Sometimes it's white and Métis. So th they had different categories over time, but, but you can see the numbers of deaths rise here, 1928 of First Nations people to 1940, it's 166. Um, and the numbers of, uh, of deaths excluding Indians here, 331 to 203. So we see here the First Nations deaths, uh, the numbers are rising over time. And as the disease comes under control among the, the non-First Nations population, that's when this idea of a, you know, a First Nations menace, a health menace, off, um, you know, in surrounding communities comes to, comes to be.